Please keep your microphones muted and videos off during the webinar. The mute and video controls are located on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Also, please feel free to type questions for our presenters into the chat box at any time. The chat button is located in the bottom center of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can as time allows. If you have any questions or difficulties with the Zoom technology, you can type your questions into the chat or alternatively email Jerry Clark or Scott Rice. Royce. And, and they will assist you. They will post their emails or, and, and contact information in the chat. <clears throat> If you are having difficulties with your audio, the call-in information for the Zoom will also be provided in the chat. With that, we will now hear from Dr. Paul Mitchell, the UW-Madison professor and extension funded faculty for agriculture and applied economics based at UW-Madison campus. He will be talking with us about late and prevented planting options and considerations going forward. So welcome, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, we'll get started here. Um, welcome everyone to this nice afternoon. What I'm gonna do today is briefly, and I, I, I like to, I can talk fast and I, I tend to at the beginning here, I will go through our sort of our current season's progress and then why we need to talk about late and preventive planning. This year, it doesn't seem like it's been a major issue, but yeah, I think it will be from time to time. And then we'll spend the majority of the time talking about late and preventive plant options for farmers and the benefits and cost of each option. So every week, the USDA on puts out the crop progress report. This is a couple of the key tables from the one that just came out um, for last Sunday is when it was the dated for, it came out on Monday. Um, the table across the top there is just the corn planted emerge, et cetera, um, for corn, oats, soybeans, and tillage. And then they have the various crop reporting districts and then the state average. And you might see these quoted in the press. Um, this week, um, as of Sunday, we had 78% of the oats planted, 52% emerged, 69% of corn planted, 26% emerged. 55% of soybeans are planted and 17% emerged. But you can see the variation regionally there. If you like, you want to see like the corn, about 80, 85% of the corn in Wisconsin and the Southern part has been planted. Um, and you know, oats 90 plus percent is already planted. You can see your region of the state. The other thing is they report these crop conditions. And so you can see there 84% of our wheat is in good to excellent condition, which is pretty solid. And 78% of our hay and pasture, 76% um, are in good to excellent. So it's a bit, it's a good year. Um, you'll see these plots as well, and the, the links are on there um, at the bottom if you want to get these plots at any time. Um, but you can see we're pretty much been on schedule here. The solid line is the current year. The dash, the darker dash line is last year, and then the lighter colored line is the um, five-year average. Planting has kind of been on schedule as of Sunday. Um, you can see already with this nice weather we've had, we're going to jump ahead of schedule there. We're a little bit ahead already of um, five-year average in corn and even more on soybeans, maybe a day. But with this nice weather we've had these last few days, you can see we're going to jump ahead of our five-year average in last year. But emergence has pretty much been right on schedule there. And you can see the green um, green lines that are all on top of each other. So planting is at different times, but the emergence is hitting. We're right on schedule. What's the weather been like? You can see it's been a little cool for big chunks of the state. Up in the western part, it's about average. Um, most of the state's been a degree or two, three even below average. A little bit of rain, particularly in the southwest, but in general, it's been a great spring so far. Um, drought monitor, people like to look at this, keep track of it. You know, if you're thinking about board of trade and prices, eastern corn belt's in pretty good shape. There's really nothing going on there. There's that persistent dry area in western Iowa and Nebraska. Nebraska's got a lot of irrigation, so I don't think it matters too much there, but you know, the markets will be watching that western corn belt um, areas to make sure it just kind of as we move into the season. But it's been a good year. But preventive plant, remember 2019, that was a bad year. Um, the figure on the left is a map. Um, it just shows the percent of acres in those regions by county that were prevented plant in 2019. Big pocket in South Dakota. We had some several there as well, uh, but down along the lower Mississippi River Valley over there in Michigan, Ohio, big prevented plant, just too much rain. You can see the figure on the right there is just a bar graph, how much above the normal that was. Almost 20 million acres were prevented plant declared officially that year. 
well above anything we'd seen. And a lot of people don't remember, but even 2020 had a lot of prevention planned. The second highest ever at 10 million acres. Um, and so it was a it was a bad year for um, 2019. Here's where it was in Wisconsin. You can see the various counties that really hit. The red ones had over 25% of the acres were prevented plant. The orangey colored ones are um, less, but these are the top counties in the state in 2019. You can see those pockets. Corn, we had 12.4% of the state of the state's corn acres were prevented plant. Our previous high was only 6.6%. Soybeans wasn't quite as bad. It's got a longer planting season. 7.3% in 2019 were prevented plant. The previous high had only been is 5.5. 5.4%. So it was a bad year. A lot of prevented plant that year. There was a lot of stuff going on. Um, we'll come back to that. This figure here is just U.S. and Wisconsin average corn yields from USDA NAS. There's 2019. This prevented plant definitely impacted yields. You can see the little blip there um, for corn, especially um, soybean. It's got various blips, but um, there's a big, or I shouldn't call it a drop, really. You can see a projection in there for the, the, the rest of the year as well um, for 2023 as those last ones are dashed. Wisconsin's been doing quite well since then. Um, we've been above average. We're in the red. Um, our corn has been above average. We had record yields the last two years, 180 bushels per acre, and they're projecting even more for 2023. Um, um, we follow trend. National is getting back up there again. Um, that the, We'll see what happens. But one of the reasons prices have been eroding is if things are on trend in the acres that are we expect to be planted, we're gonna have some large corn and soybean crops. And that's why prices have been, one of the reasons why prices have been eroding at the, for the December 23 corn. So why are we talking about late preventive plant? We got a great year going on here. Um, this is some data for those of you, um, there's this Wisconsin Initiative for Climate Change Impacts. It's called Wiki, W-I-C-C-I, hit their weight major pager, W-I-C-C-I.wis.edu. I'm under this trend in projections that little tab up there um, with the white one that's underlined the top um, left there. And that's what you get. There's just, a, these aren't even all of them. They have a lot of nice little maps. They have the historical data first and then down below it is some future projections for the 20 years from 2041 to 2060. So up there in the future, I'm gonna poke in on a couple of them here. 2019 is gonna happen again and probably again. Um, this is the historical change. MAM is March, April, May. We'll think of that as spring. Um, so the left figure is a historical change in March, April, May precipitation from 2050 to 2018. The southern part of the state, it's been that 20% increase in that um, percent of spring rain. So we've had a 20% increase in the amount of rain that falls in March, April, and May. Annual average there um, is on the right. That's, a, that's high again in the southern part of the state, again, about 20%. Um, that's for the full year, not just March, April, and May, but Wisconsin's getting wetter. That's pretty much the whole state, except for that north um, in spring, except for that very northeastern corner um, north of Green Bay. Um, it, it's up to some amount there. North, northern Wisconsin hasn't seen quite as much, but you can definitely see where most of the crop production is. It's up 10, 15, 20 percent. Um, that's for the historical data from what it was to what it is lately. And they also have these projections into the future, that 2040 to 2060 period. What these maps on the left and the right are is the December, January, February, the winter precipitation, and then the March, April, May on the right. What you see here is this is the percent increase between 30 years from 1981 to 2010, and then how much more there will be in those 20 years from 2040 to 2040 or 2060. So another 10% above that generally, a little bit smaller maybe in the winter in the southern Wisconsin, 5 to 10%. But on top of what we've been having, another 10% increase in precipitation is projected over the next, um, up through 2060. So Wisconsin's definitely getting wetter and a big chunk of that is coming in the spring. So as I say, 2019 will happen again and again, most likely. So talking crop insurance, because most farmers have crop insurance. These are historical participation rates. I haven't updated them for the last few years, but it's been pretty steady. Um, in general, what I tell people if I get on the press or just talking to people, about three, four, 75 to 80 percent of Wisconsin corn and soybean acres are insured. That's just the way it is. There's always a little bit more soybean than corn, but we have a very, our participation rate is, that 70, is in that range of 75 to 80 percent each year, sometimes a little higher. Our neighboring states, it's even higher. Illinois, Minnesota, they're in the 90s easily on corn and beans. So there's plenty of states that are pretty high. We're a little bit lower. So now we'll switch over to the what we're talking about here, this late and prevented planting. We've had a great year going on so far. It looks like it's going well. 
I expect to be getting above average planting in terms of our percent plant acres. Um, and, but I think we're gonna be seeing these wet springs more and more often here in Wisconsin. So these, this, even though it doesn't seem to pertain this year, it did when we were planting. And I think we will be hearing about late preventive planting from time to time again. So what there are, are these three key dates, that's what the blue ones are. That's the earliest plant date, the final plant date and the end of the late planting period. Those three dates define three periods, the planting period um, in green, then the late planting period in the middle there, and then the prevented plant period. Um, these dates and the periods at the length, even the, the different width of these periods, the planting period, for example, varies in length, depending on where you are. It varies by crop and it varies by county. So the USDA Risk Management Agency makes these little maps and we'll show you some in a second. But these three days define these three periods and that's what we're talking about. And they vary by county and by crop. So there is, Corn one is different than the soybean one, depends on which county you're in. So these figures here, um, this we're gonna do three sets of figures. This is the map of the earliest planting date, then the, we'll do the other three. These are the ones that just changed for 2023. Um, and so that's, I presented these at the Wisconsin Agribusiness um, Commodity Classic down in the Alliant Energy Center. Um, April 10th is the earliest planting date for corn in about the southern two thirds and April 21st, that um, northern um, third. You can see the colors there. It used to be April 11th, so it changed a little bit. Um, it got a day earlier, but um, these were just updated in 2023. Um, so it's now April 21st. You can plant before then, but if you do, you no longer qualify for replant coverage. So if your corn gets frosted off, um, it's you got to replant it yourself. It's not that there's no coverage for it. Um, the big changes in soybeans, it used to be for the whole state, it was April 26th. Now you can see the southern, very southern, we'll say third is now April 15th. That middle half is about April 20th. And that very northern tier is now April 30th. So if you're in those areas and you planted before those dates, you can still insure it, but you not you don't have replant coverage. But I don't think a whole lot of corn and soybeans went in before these dates this year. But these are the big changes. That sets that first period. I'm going to go back a slide. That sets its earliest planting date, depending on which county you're in. And look at maps for the next two. Um, so that's the earliest planting date. Here's the final planting dates, and then we'll look at that um, last one. These haven't changed. Um, and so May 25th for corn grain, May 31st for corn silage, up on that very northern fringe of the top of the northern part of Wisconsin. So as of tomorrow was the 25th, and so on Friday you will be in the late planting period. Um, they will for corn for grain up in northern Wisconsin. We got more time here in the majority of the state. May 31st for corn for grain, corn for silage up until June 5th. Soybeans, these dates aren't until June. Um, and so we've got plenty of time yet. But um, I think with this nice weather, we're gonna see a lot of planting. This is the end of the late planting period. And so if you plant after this, it's not insurable. So um, June 19th and June 25th for corn for grain, corn for silage way up there in the Northern part. Majority of the states, June 25th and June 30th, and then July 5th for soybeans in the northern chunk, but that very southern third is July 10th, you can plant soybeans. So just to get a sense of how this works here, these are some tables. I picked one in southern Wisconsin, Dane County, sort of that north central part, Marathon County, and then I did Bayfield County for the southern, uh, I'm sorry, for the northern one. I guess I should have switched them around, but Bayfield in the top, Marathon in the middle, and Dane in the lower part of the graph or the table. But what you can see here is that earliest planting period to final planting period, that's the traditional time you plant. It varies for corn. It's April 10th, May 31st, June 5th for silage, you can see. But in northern Wisconsin, it's much smaller here, April 21st to May 25th. So they've only got about a month to plant up there for corn for grain. Southern Wisconsin up there in Dane County got um, you know, a lot longer time, April 10th, to May 31st. So for that crop, it's a larger planting period, but it varies by which part of the state you're in. Look at soybeans, April 15th to June 15th, that's that's two months. You go to Northern Wisconsin though, it's only April 30th to June 10th. So it's a much narrower planting window. If you plant during that period, you're fine. Um, most like I said, about 75 to 80% of these acres are insured. Then the, that gap between the final planting and the end of the late planting between those last two columns, that's what we call the late planting period. We're almost into that for Northern Wisconsin here. That's at May 25th here, whoops. Um, that's that May 25th period. During that late planting period, we'll talk about that. We are, we're approaching that here. By the end of the month, we'll be in that in northern, or I'm sorry, in most of Wisconsin, May 31st here after this weekend. 
we will be in the late planting period for corn and early June there for um, soybeans in the big chunks of the state. And then after that is that late planting period. If you plant after that, that's a period when you're, you're, it's no longer insurable. So we got these three, um, uh, that's kind of an example. And so you can kind of see these three maps. Um, we're, this is that planting period. We're gonna be focusing on that late planting period and that prevented plant period. Those last two parts, we're almost, we're just now moving out of the planting period for um, parts of the, some crops and some parts of the state. And um, we'll be moving into that late planting period for pretty, good, pretty quick for corn, for, for grain particularly. So you have to know your county and your um, which crop you're talking about. So now suppose it's a late planting period for a crop. Let's say it's been raining. You're kind of hitting this end of May period. You're getting nervous. What are your options as a farmer? I'm going to go through these four options for farmers. And the focus is going to be kind of thinking about it from a Wisconsin perspective, where the goal is is yeah, I can't quite maybe do something, I'm gonna look at forage, forage production. This was some materials I developed in 2019 when we were really getting, really getting concerned. So what do you got for options? Number one is plant the crop late and then reduce your guarantee as a result of late planting. We'll talk about that one in more detail. You can take a partial prevented plant indemnity, a smaller indemnity, plant something else on time, like say go from corn to soybeans, for example, but you're gonna to have to accept a yield reduction or a yield history reduction. Um, we'll talk about that in more detail. The other option, if you're in this late plant or yeah, late planting period, you can take the full prevented plant indemnity. It's a larger payment, but then there's restrictions on what you can do with those acres for the remainder of the season. <clears throat> and then the last thing is you can do it, do whatever you want and leave those acres uninsured. You can, you know, plant something completely different, do whatever you want. They're just not insured. So we're going to go through each of these now. So it's a, we're in the late planting period. We're going to do option one. I decide to take late planting. It's at least disruptive. You're, you're just a day or two late, just plant your corn. Don't worry about it. Um, there's a penalty. You got to reduce your yield or your revenue guarantee by 1% for each day you're late, but you still pay the same premium. So a farmer's a little you know, upset there. I'm getting less coverage, but I'm paying the same cost. Um, but if it's only a small part of your acreage and it's only a couple of days short, it's not that big a deal. Um, but a lower guarantee, so like that's your your average yield times your the board of trade price times the coverage level. So that's your guarantee in like dollars per acre. That guarantee, you lose 1% per day. A lower guarantee means you're less likely to trigger payments. Um, and if you do um, trigger payments, they're going to be smaller if you have a lower guarantee. So there is a cost. And then what they're accounting for is the fact that you're planting, la planting late. And so um, you just don't have as much yield um, potential there. So you don't get as much coverage. The other problem is that it screws up your yield history. Um, you have lower yields are more likely, and so you're likely to have um, to reduce your yield history for all your corn or soybean acres, and that's going to affect your future guarantees. So this is this is an okay option in general if it's not that many acres on a small part of your farm and it's only late by a few days. Um, you start, but if you look at those late planting periods, they start getting pretty long. They get up they're up to 25 days long, and then even some more. By the end, you're talking a 25% reduction in your guarantee. That's getting pretty serious if it's getting to be the late part of that late planting period. So it can become quite costly. That's when you start thinking about, maybe I don't want to take that late planting. So maybe a late planting is not a big deal if it's just like, there is a, you have to have 20% or 20 acres before you can even have a late planting. So if you have like five acres on a, you know, you, you insure three, 400 acres, and you only have five acres, it's not a big deal. You don't even have to declare it. You just plant it late. Don't worry about it. But if you hit that 20% or 20 acres, then you have to go through this process. Um, and it's not too bad if it's a small part of your operation, it's only a few days, but it starts to be a problem when it starts to get the end of the late planting period. We're a long ways from that yet. So that's late planting. The other option is to take a partial prevented plant payment, a smaller one, and then plant something else. So what are its benefits? Well, you're able to plant and harvest other crops for income. You go, you switch from corn to soybeans, or maybe you switch from corn for grain to corn silage. Nothing happens in terms of your, um, you still get full insurance on the second crop, the alternative, you get full coverage for the silage or full coverage for the soybean. Um, what you also can do is like, you know, I was hoping to plant silage, corn silage. I don't want to plant so soybeans. I need this forage. And so you just plant something else to get, so to get forage. That becomes your alternative crop. Maybe you insure it, maybe you don't. Uh, but you, you can do forage production during the current year as an alternative crop. You can even establish alfalfa on there um, for next year's production. So it's like, you know, it's getting late. It's late June. I can't get my, couldn't get my corn, corn silage in. I decided to just plant, take the 
partial preventive plant identity. I'm going to start planting some, establish some alfalfa in the summer. I can even harvest it whenever I want. You can take off an early cutting of alfalfa um, as an establishment year. What are the costs though? You're only going to get, you're going to get that smaller indemnity. It's only 35% of the full payment. And so it ends up being 35% or 55%. There, it ends up being almost 20% of your full guarantee. So you're, you're going to get a small indemnity to compensate you for not getting your normal cropping in. So you lose some, you know, about 19.25% of what you paid. So it's definitely smaller. And here's the kicker though, those acres that you plant, that you take that small indemnity on, let's say you planted, you were going to plant corn, you switch over to soybeans, you still count the yield on your normally planted corn that's on time. You take 60% of that yield and apply that to these late plant or the soybean acres you plant that you took that partial indemnity on. So it's kind of a weird thing there is I was going to plant corn, couldn't do it. I took this partial indemnity and then I planted soybeans and soybeans are normal, no big deal. But I have to take 60% of the yield on my other corn acres and apply that to my yield history from these soybean acres that I took the small prevented plant indemnity for. So it does contribute to your yield history. And so some farmers are a little anxious about that because your goal is to keep your yield history as high as possible because that maximizes your coverage. So they, if it's a large portion of your acres, you might not be excited about that, um, especially if you end up with a low yield. 6% um, of a low yield is a small number. It can really reduce your yield history for future years. So that's that second option. Take a partial prevented plant indemnity um, and then plant something else. And there's a, there is a yield history impact. The next one is taking a full prevented plant. You're in that late planting period to say, I want the full, give me the full indemnity and then I'm going to plant some forage cover crop. You get the largest indemnity, you get 55% of your guarantee. So that's you're maximizing your prevented plant payment. It's not the full one, but you don't get full guarantee because um, you're also reducing your costs. You don't have harvest costs, you don't have some other management costs. And so that you don't get the full indemnity. Whereas if you actually get through the planted on time and there's a total loss, say like, you know, in, in August, there's a tornado wipes out all your corn, rips it to nothing, you would get 100% of your guarantee. If you take the prevented plant at this time of year, you would get 55% of your guarantee. These acres do not contribute to your yield history. They're just treated as unplanted. You don't get any, there's no zeros or anything. It's just, you get your yield history off of your planted acres. You can even plant alfalfa again for next year's production. You can graze it. You can make hay off of it. You can make silage or haylage or bedding, but you have to wait until September 1st. You got that full indemnity. You can't make any kind of forage stuff off of it or bedding or anything until after September 1st. So the yield quality of that forage isn't necessarily there. Like um, if you took the partial prevented plant, you can take it earlier. Um, you have some costs. You got this crop cover crop establishment. You're gonna have to do some weed control. Some farmers um, maybe will mow it or they will um, you know, uh, maybe use a herbicide or something like that to keep the weeds down so you don't go to seed. If you do a cover crop, you gotta pay for that. The key though, is you can never harvest that any kind of cover crop for grain or seed, even after September 1st. They allow you now in these new rules to make forage or bedding off of it, but not a grain or seed. So you can't go off and take any kernels of anything off. Um, but, and you always have to wait till after September 1st. So on these prevented plant acres, the key is it has to be considered a cover crop. And so you must manage it as a cover crop, not as a forage crop. They don't want you planting sorghum for, for silage or something on there. That's an alternative crop. Then you're supposed to take the partial prevented plant and make a full use as a forage crop. If you're going to do it as a cover crop, you have to manage it that way. And in 2019, the RMA said, yes, you can use corn and soybeans for a cover crop if you want, but you have to manage it as a cover crop. That means you got to use higher seeding densities. Um, you got to use less fertilizer. You can't be putting things like pesticides down because you're trying to improve the production. It's a cover crop. It is not a forage crop. You can, but you can take make silage from it, but it's got to be managed as a cover crop. Weed control is even okay. You can mow it during the summer, even before September 1st, but you cannot harvest it. And so they're recommending to keep it clear is to take document with photos to show that you um, were mowing it for a reason and then show the, how you harvest it. You didn't harvest the biomass that was ruined on there. You can establish alfalfa with the nurse crop. You can harvest it as forage, but you gotta wait till after September 1st. Might be a good option. You just gotta pick the dates. There was an issue, somebody wanted to rent it out. You can't rent it out with the recommending. What you're better off doing is custom hiring your neighbor to plant and harvest the forage cover crop, and then you sell him the forage. Then don't rent him the land to plant out the cover crop on. Um, it's just, it came up that year in 2019. 
The other thing is just always communicate with your crop insurance agent. There's a whole bunch of new rules. No one knew them. Our made did a lot, a lot of clarification. Farmers should get the final word from their crop insurance agent, not from the crop consultant, not from a university person, the crop insurance agent. They are the official conduit for all these legal contracts between the insurance company and the farmer. And they always recommend documenting these, any communications in writing with the emails and texts, and then the practices you took, you did use photos. So that's prevented plant for this year. Any questions or comments? Well, let's hope we have a good year um, and we don't have to worry about that this year. But like I said, I think this will be coming up from time to time again, like it did in 2019. So um, I'm around, you got my contact information there. Go ahead and reach out. I will put these slides on my page. I can give them, the, the, the folks here will have them as well. They can put them on the, um, the Bradshaw Crop Connect page or however they want to do it. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell. Are there any other questions for him before we move on? If not, we will now hear from Dr. Damon Smith as he is loading up his slides. There we go. Okay, good. Um, Dr. Damon Smith is a UW-Madison professor and extension funded faculty of plant pathology, specifically field crops pathologist, uh, and he will be talking with us about small grain disease management. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for thanks for attending today, everybody. I do want to just kick off a couple of resources. Um, I you know I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you with lots of data and information today, and you're gonna probably walk away here from here and be like, you know what? I'd like to go look at other places for some of that information. Uh, so a couple of uh, places to go. Uh, the Badger Crop Doc uh, website, of course, uh, badgercropdoc.com. That's uh, pretty Wisconsin centric, mostly all out of my program. I'm also an active participant in the Crop Protection Network, which is a, a national effort uh, put together by plant pathologists. Uh, some of the information I'm going to present today is from the Crop Protection Network, and we all um, participate quite readily in large group efforts of which I'm gonna show some data. This The slides uh, a little later on are, are gonna have Ohio State all over them, but remember, we're part of these uh, large national efforts. Uh, Ohio State simply uh, put the slides together and I agreed to keep the formatting, but uh, understand that there's Wisconsin data uh, even in, in those uh, slide decks. So uh, uh, again, a, a pretty sound national effort there with the Crop Protection Network. The other uh, resource uh, to check out, most of you have probably seen the 2022 uh, fungicide and, and disease management test reports are out. There are reports going back uh, 10 years now uh, in those summaries. I would encourage you to uh, read not only 2022, uh, but also past reports and, and look at trends in, in certain products. And I, I should note, I am not endorsing any products in there. Those are just products that they get tested. Now, in terms of, I'm going to focus today on uh, weed diseases, given I have a, a short amount of time. Uh, that's where we spend most of our effort uh, in the small grains world. Is a major rotation crop for us uh, here in the state. Uh, and we have four uh, diseases, but two really, two really are the significant ones that we pay attention to and spend uh, most of our time trying to concentrate on. And those would be fusarium head blight and stripe rust. Um, the other two uh, to round out the four are septuria leaf blotch, uh, and then occasionally leaf rust uh, comes in, and you can see images uh, on the on the slides there. I'm going to spend today focused again with my short time on fusarium head blight mainly. I'll mention stripe rust just a little bit. I can tell you right now that the wheat crop, at least the wheat I have looked at, uh, looks very good. Uh, it's been reasonably dry uh, from a from a disease standpoint, so we don't have a lot of disease action happening, and I have not seen any stripe rust up to this point. Just to remind you, there are three types of rusts. Uh, we're mainly concerned with the one in the center, uh, so the stripe rust, or what the Europeans call yellow rust. Um, it gets its name, both of its names, obviously, because it's pretty yellow in color and then stripes because it typically tries to line up and stripes on the, on the leaves. 
We also have leaf rust, which uh, is a little more brick red. We have really good uh, single um, resistance genes uh, actually to leaf rust uh, and most of the wheat uh, varieties deployed here. So we see it move in late in the season. This is a little warmer weather loving rust. So it's usually a late season issue for us in, in Wisconsin when it comes in. It's usually only on highly susceptible uh, varieties here in the state. And the same with stem rust, uh, which uh, this is where a lot of the breeding efforts historically have been placed is on stem rust because it is a quite uh, devastating uh, disease. But I see very little uh, stem rust except on a couple of known shocks, usually in a variety of trials where I run into that. So again, resistance has done very well uh, against stem rust and leaf rust. Stripe rust is starting to catch up, but the um, single gene resistance is not as well known. And uh, this one is really likes cool weather. So that's why it tends to be a problem for us here, um, here in Wisconsin. The other issue with uh, stripe rust is that because it does like cooler weather in some years, we can have overwintering of inoculum. You may remember if you've ever taken a plant pathology course, we, we talk about the rust pathway. So typically with most rusts, uh, including stem rust, uh, leaf rust, and in many years, stripe rust, the overwintering uh, of the inoculum or spores that start an epidemic is actually down here in, in Texas and Louisiana. This is, it does not typically overwinter in Wisconsin, although my lab has documented the occasional overwintering of leaf rust, or I'm sorry, stripe rust spores here in the state. That did not occur this year, so we do not have any resident inoculum. So what we're waiting on is basically spores to blow up through the rust past pathway uh, from the deep south up. Really, the current reports only have stripe rust, uh, you know, in Texas, um, maybe a little bit in Mississippi and Louisiana. And so it's pretty far from us here in Wisconsin. And the reason why I'm spending some time talking about this is because right now we're kind of coming into this emerging flag leaf period. And this would be the time where we'd want to make a decision for a fungicide uh, to protect, protect against stripe rust. And currently, I do not think it is needed here in Wisconsin. So we can hold off on that uh, flag leaf application uh, of stripe rust and start to focus on our, our next um, disease, which I'll talk about, uh, fusarium head blight. Just to finish out my stripe rust conversation here, this is a this is a cycle uh, of the of the disease. Just to understand that it is windblown. Again, it has to come most of the years. The inoculum has to come from the deep south, rides uh, the upper air currents up. Uh, hopscotching basically up through the Mississippi River Valley and then arrives here and we can have repeating cycles. The last significant stripe rust cycle we had or stripe rust uh, disease epidemic we had was around 2017, 2018. And we did have some overwintering inoculum in those years. Therefore, it started very early around this emerging flag leaf timing. And then we had several cycles uh, where it really blew up fast. So keep that in mind when it comes in early, it can really ramp up fast. And that's why I urge people to kind of do some scouting around that emerging flag leaf period to, to catch this one in advance. We'll shift gears now, and I'm going to focus from here on out on, on fusarium head blight and how we're managing this. This is our most significant disease here in the state. This differs a bit uh, from stripe rust in a couple of key ways. The first of which is that um, it, it, it is a, the pathogen that causes fusarium head blight is a pathogen also of corn. So we do have a lot of resident inoculum here in the state. It can overwinter on either corn residue, wheat residue. It can overwinter on other grasses. So the moral of the story here is if we're thinking about where those epidemics initiate, we have very local epidemic initiation, even within field, uh, depending on our rotations. Understand that these are wind and rain splash spores, but we really only have one cycle per season, which makes it also different from stripe rust in that the, the window of opportunity for the fungus is rather narrow. The spores really can only inf infect through the open flowers. So the start of anthesis, and I'll talk about these growth stages here in a minute, it's basically the start of anthesis through about seven to 10 days after the start. That's the window. So the fungus really only has about 10 days to actually get in the head uh, and cause infection. This is why we spend so much time talking about uh, fungicide application timing when it comes to fusarium head blight because your opportunity to put a fungicide on is the same time that the spores infect. So our time starts from the start of anthesis through about 
uh, seven to 10 days after uh, the start of a thesis. And I've talked uh, at Badger Crop Connects in, in years past about optimal timing. And really our research in Wisconsin says that you can actually reduce Don levels, uh, vomitoxin, uh, that is, uh, in the finished grain, if you want to wait just a little bit, about five days after the start of anthesis is really the actual optimal timing in terms of reducing vomitoxin actually in the grain. And again, a lot of this timing has to do with just the biology and epidemiology of the fungus. Now, if your head is spinning and you're thinking, you know, Smith, you're full of crap, you know, this is this is, I'm not a biologist. I just want you to tell me where to go so I can figure out whether I'm at risk or not. There's a place for that. And that is uh, wheatscab.psu.edu. This is the up updated Fusarium risk tool. I actually pulled this image down this morning. I would encourage everybody to start paying attention here as we approach that anthesis period. And essentially what this is doing is it's a, it's a, a forecasting system using weather information across the, the national grid, uh, looking at low, medium, or high risk of, of disease. You can even play around with some of the tools. Uh, there's these drop downs over here in the far left, and you can actually tailor that to specific varieties. If you know resistance in your particular variety, it'll actually offset that risk. You can also even scroll ahead two, four, six days and get forecast by clicking on these bricks uh, across the top. So as of this morning, while I was drinking my coffee, I pulled this map down and we're currently at low risk. This makes sense to me as a pathologist. We are pretty dry in the world of diseases. So we haven't had a lot of foliar wetness in the morning, extended periods of leaf wetness. I have not had any or much dew on my sneakers in the morning when I walk across the lawn. Uh, these are good telltale signs of whether we're setting up uh, or not. Uh, for disease. So pay attention, visit this website every couple of days, especially as we're approaching that flowering period in wheat, and this will help you make that decision on, on really whether you need a fungicide application at that fusarium head blight timing. I can tell you that in many years, I would estimate, you know, if I just pull a percentage, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the time, we will need a fungicide somewhere in that head blight uh, timing. So this does tend to ramp up pretty quick. Uh, it's been a rarity. We've had, uh, I think it was 2021, we were really, really dry and did not have any risk and we could have held off that year. But again, that's that's a rare thing. We really do usually need a fungicide application at that end thesis timing. So with that, let's uh, dig in a bit on management here. I would like to direct you to uh, Sean Conley's uh, varietal uh, testing program. We, uh, in my program, rate uh, all the varieties that are entered in all the locations uh, for Fusarium head blight. If it occurs, uh, 2022, we were able to get some data on those varieties that was published in 2022. I know everybody has weed in the ground already, but you can go back and look at this if you uh, know the variety and, and decide whether uh, it's more of a susceptible or more of a resistant variety. This will help you in, in making some management decisions just knowing the variety. As you plan ahead for the next crop, use this data uh, 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 to make some decisions. And you can see there are there is a wide range of fusarium head blight ratings here. You know, these are the two columns uh, right here, hopefully you can see my arrow and you can see some higher ratings here and then some lower ratings. So we get a lot of, a lot of differences when we go into those variety testing programs. Look across locations too. Look at uh, varieties that do really well in more than one location. So spend some time there. That's really the foundation uh, to get, a, get yourself ahead. And I'll show some data to back that up here in a second. The other place is the Crop Protection Network. Like I mentioned, I contribute to this, uh, this table um, uh, annually. This is the efficacy uh, for uh, wheat diseases. Uh, these are fungicides that all get tested across the national wheat um, uh, uh, belt. Uh, and you can see what the ratings are. These are non-biased ratings. These are extension folks making these ratings. None of us are paid by companies to do this. So these are real world ratings here for all the different diseases. So if you're curious about the performance, say, of a particular product, or if it's even labeled or has a rating, you can find a head scab right here, and you can see all the things that are labeled and have been tested. We do wait until we have a couple of years of data uh, before we start uh, putting items in here. So you may have something that you're 
uh, really eyeballing and you're not finding it in the table, that's just because we don't have enough data yet to make a call on it. So uh, keep that in mind. These are rigorous uh, testing uh, programs and, and uh, we, we um, take good pride in what these ratings actually are uh, in these fungicide testing tables. I did mention that grow staging is very important. Make sure you can grow stage wheat. Uh, the grasses can be tough sometimes, especially when they're in the vegetative uh, phases. Uh, Sean's program worked with uh, Mimi Bruski and the Nutrient Pest Management Program, and they've authored a publication on uh, grow staging wheat. Uh, you can download that as a PDF. You can get a hold of the Nutrient Pest Management Program to get hard copies, but FIX 8, in my opinion, in Wisconsin, FIX 8 is a major time. Uh, so that emerged flag leaf, uh, uh, the one right at the end of that main stem, that's a really critical time to do some scouting. And then again, uh, right at the start of anthesis. So 10.5 is when the head is fully emerged. Anthesis is 10.5.1. When we start to see 50% of those main stems with at least one flower out. Uh, on the head. So make sure you understand clearly what those growth stages are. I get a lot of calls where folks think they have one growth stage. I go look at the field and it's, you know, they're not even in the ballpark. So uh, it can be tough and it is really critical if, especially with head blight, if we miss that by more than a week, uh, we're, in, we're in big trouble uh, in terms of economics and making these fungicides work. Just to show you, uh, again, here's where we start with some of this group effort. Uh, this slide uh, put together by Pierce Paul at Ohio State, but you can see the early, mid, and late flowering periods. So if we're on the FIX scale, FIX 10.5.1, we're going to have those first flowers out, usually right around the center part of the head. FIX 10.5.2 is full bloom, and then 10.5.3, you can see some of those flowers are starting to actually become pale and starting to actually fall off. This would be late. So we're starting to edge out of the window of opportunity there with a fungicide at that point. Again, this is our this is our window of opportunity. If we go too early with our fungicide application, it'd be like we didn't spray. And if we go too late, same thing, it'd be like we didn't spray. So you're going to be blowing, you know, 20 to $30 per acre on a fungicide application if you don't get this uh, timing right. The other thing to be aware of is uh, pre-harvest intervals. Uh, you know, folks in the past have reached out, you know, they see visual symptoms and, you know, they want to go in and spray and try to cure the problem. Fungicides don't work that way. And you will find yourself outside the pre-harvest interval. So be careful at these late heading and anthesis timings. We also have to be on time because we're going to be <clears throat> bumping up against that pre-harvest interval uh, pretty quick. So keep that in, in mind. All right, so let's look at uh, some fungicide uh, data now. Again, this is a large national data set. I realize it has Ohio State on there, um, but I promise to keep the formatting of these slides the same. Wisconsin data is in here, uh, as well as uh, other national um, data sets. So this is a, a sound, large, uh, big data set. This is specifically targeted at looking at new products versus what's been a standard uh, uh, in the industry over the last few years. And that standard mostly was Persaro, although you will see some Caramba in here. So here are the, the treatments that were uh, deployed in these uniform fungicide trials. This was all supported by the United um, US um, uh, uh, Wheat and uh, uh, Barley Scab Initiative. So we had a non-treated check, uh, Persaro and Caramba as our positive checks, and then some of these newer products, Mirvis Ace, Persaro Pro, and Spherex are all new products. We even asked the question, what about two past programs where you came in at FIX 10.5.1 and then came back four to six days later, even with a second application? I'm not sold on this, although you're going to see uh, some interesting data there. I would not uh, advocate for this. If you get a good solid single application on somewhere in that window, it's almost as good as, you know, agonizing over two applications during that window. I think it's, you know, just logistically uh, nearly impossible to get two applications on in that, that very short window. But we have the data so you can you can look at it. So here's the first data slide. Again, national data set. There's many, many observations in here. I'm talking about, you know, 40 plus uh, you know, trials included in this data set. So here are the averages here. 
you'll notice that everything essentially was better than the non-treated check in, in terms of reducing scab, ranging from 68 to 95% uh, reduction in scab. These three bars here, which are labeled six, seven, and eight, these are our two pass uh, programs. Three, uh, four, and five would be uh, Mirvis Ace, Prosaro Pro, and Spherex, respectively. And then here are our previous standards, which would be uh, Prosaro and Caramba. So you'll see that the newer products right in there, maybe even just a little better uh, compared to our standards in terms of FHB index reduction. Of course, we're also concerned about how much vomitoxin is accumulating in, in the grain. Remember, you know, the fungus infects, but it's also producing this mycotoxin, deoxyvalinol or vomitoxin. And you can see everything, again, giving us a nice reduction uh, relative to the check. Yes, perhaps if you squint one eye, the two passes look maybe a little bit better, but we're splitting hairs because we're all below about 1% deoxyvalinol, which in most elevators might not even uh, ne necessitate a, a dock fee. So, um, you know, my, my sort of my takeaway for you here is that yes, the newer products look decent. They are right in the wheelhouse, but timing is still really the most important piece. So concentrating on getting whichever favorite product you have that's labeled for head scab and making sure you're getting it on at anthesis or, or at least inside of a week of the start of anthesis is, is really, really important. We can also spin the data set just a little differently and we can actually compare to a standard and see what kind of percent increase in efficacy we got above uh, Prosaro. So we're, we're comparing everything to Prosaro. So we pulled Prosaro out here and we're now looking at those products in comparison. So Caramba, really not any better than, um, than uh, Prosaro. Here's Miravis Ace with about 40% improvement uh, in terms of FHB index. Uh, we have uh, Prosaro Pro here. Here's Sphere X, which is right around zero. This is, if we calculate the error, that's inside error. And then you can see the two pass programs, yes, you know, pretty significant increase over, you know, a single application of Prosaro. But again, I think logistically, it's going to be pretty hard to get those on there. And we're going to do just as good a job, um, statistically speaking. Uh, where we where we apply in that in that window. So here are the Don data. So this is uh, again that mycotoxin in terms of the percent efficacy uh, relative to Prosaro. And you can see nice improvements with those newer products with Miravisase, uh, Prosaro uh, Pro, and Spherex in terms of reducing Don. So you know I do I do think that there's um, you know some something there with these newer products you may want to look at those if you can get a hold of them again timing is going to be the same as as, as it has always been for Prosaro and Caramba uh, but perhaps we can edge edge out Prosaro uh, with improved vomitoxin reduction at least that's what the data says across the national weed belt now in terms of integrated management I'm a big fan of this I just want to uh, send this home with a national data set I've shown Wisconsin data sets in the past where if we take a resistant variety that can get us a lot of the way there in terms of reducing uh, head blight and vomitoxin levels so spend some time with those variety ratings and trying to choose the right varieties for your location and then we can layer a fungicide on top and we'll have very good control so what's going on here, again, a large data set nationally run. There's Wisconsin data in here. I have the same uniform trials as everybody else does. Um, so, you know, 40 or so uh, trials in here where we have moderately resistant variety, a moderately susceptible variety, and then susceptible varieties. And then we're layering a fungicide, a single application of fungicide, either Persaro, uh, Mirvis Ace, Prosaro Pro or Sphere X relative to the non-treated check. Look at with a moderately resistant variety, how much less we start with in terms of FHB index on the checks relative to the moderately susceptible and susceptible. So this is what I'm saying, you know, you know, huge reduction in just variety choice alone. Yes, the fungicide gives us a little more in terms of FHB reduction, but we probably get a little more of a benefit 
in those moderately resistant varieties in terms of the, the Don reduction. So here's the Don data. Here's the moderately resistant uh, variety here with a check. And you can see nice reductions here that are, are significant. So we're a, a skosh over two parts per million, which is where docking will likely start to happen here in most of our elevators in the state. And we can drop that down below maybe one part per million with an added fungicide on top. Notice with the moderately susceptibles, sure, we might be able to get that down below that two part per million there, but it's getting a little dicey. And then with the susceptibles, we really have a challenge even with some really good fungicides there. So again, starting with a good baseline with that uh, varietal resistance is, is going to be really important as you, as you look forward. Now let's uh, look at some Wisconsin uh, specific data. This is my, uh, what I call my wheat insert trial. So uh, folks uh, can insert, um, their favorite program. I get the rights to, uh, you know, publish this stuff. This is in the uh, the fungicide book. So if you want to go look at this in more detail and understand how the trial was set up, it is in the in the 2022 trial book. You can see Spherex, uh, Prosaro, Prosaro Pro, Mirvase. So all the things along with a couple of um, uh, uh, you know uh, experimental products in there as well. Uh, but you know, quite a few, quite a few of the things we're familiar with, giving us nice, nice reductions here. Here is a two pass here where we had Triver Pro and then Miravis Ace here. We probably didn't pick up much with the early Triver Pro application. That's just because we didn't have a lot of few. Um, I'm sorry, stripe rust. Uh, earlier in the season. So that that early season application of fungicide just wasn't needed or, or didn't give us much yield benefit there. Over the top of the single application, the one doing the work is going to be that late uh, uh, season and thesis application. Here's the Don data in terms of parts per million. So we have Prosaro, uh, uh, Spherex, uh, Prosaro at a lower rate, Prosaro Pro, you know, those all doing pretty good. Yes, we didn't have a tremendously high level of, of Don there, but we were able to pick up statistically significant uh, differences there. Um, you know, again, with most of these new products doing quite well and much better uh, than the non-treated control. So my data typically has been uh, pretty consistent with what happens in the national effort. So uh, the, the ratings that you see, I stand by those uh, in the fungicide efficacy uh, data tables. And then uh, just to show you the test weight and yield uh, from those uh, trials, this was Kaskaskia, which was the, the variety we, we consider this a fairly susceptible variety. You can see that the, the test weights are usually pretty good there, but the yield does struggle just a little bit um, on occasion with Kaskaskia, especially when we have decent uh, fusarium head blight. Um, also note that, you know, our combines do a really good job of actually cleaning grain. Uh, so we don't have a lot of damage kernel data um, in here. And, and our Don data is typically fairly low uh, because the combines do such a good job of actually cleaning, cleaning that grain out. So uh, that is a good way of, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you roll into a field with really high uh, fusarium head blight, you can adjust the fan speeds and, and sieve openings a little bit to try to you know, make make that a little less of an issue uh, in the finished grain side of things. Just to bring everything home here, I've shown this before. I just want to remind you that uh, we we did uh, do this uh, what we called intensive management trial with Sean Conley's program a few years back. Uh, we we did some efforts looking at uh, over a four year period, looking at sort of what was current at the time in terms of overall management, and you can see the management. Uh, table here in the left hand side of your screen and then what we call mid level and then and then high level and really the mid the difference between the mid level and high level was uh, the application of growth regulator as long with, as long uh, along with micronutrients and then uh, a second fungicide application right around uh, the, the, the flag leaf timing otherwise the the high level and mid level uh, you know, we're, we're reasonably the same there uh, with a with a fungicide application at that feeks um, uh, feeks ten point five point one in both. And now, keep in mind during this four year period, this was uh, there was two years in here with really high stripe rust uh, epidemics. So what you're going to see is that you know we, we did quite well on on test weight deductions. Um, 
you know, Don uh, rejections and that sort of thing with the mid and high level, uh, but really the mid level is probably where it's at in terms of, you know, just making sure we have that fungicide on right around that anthesis timing that in most years is going to be good enough because uh, we don't have stripe rust every year, right? And so that that's really where the payback is. But you can see where we have those strategically placed fungicide programs. We we really don't find any uh, odds of of Don uh, reductions. So we're we're looking at the percent chance uh, given if we repeated these trials, whether we would get deductions or rejections here. And you can see quite favorable for both the mid and high level. We even did a partial, partial uh, profit uh, return uh, calculation, just looking at uh, using the cost at the time for grain and the cost at the time for products. You'll see that the mid-level program uh, penciled out on top, although all three gave us a positive return on investment. So again, where I'm going here is that, you know, if we're looking at this particular season, I do not think we need uh, that FEEX um, uh, eight or flag leaf uh, fungicide application. I think we can skip that, but uh, really focus in on, on getting the FEEX 10.5.1 application done. And I think the odds of getting good return uh, with that uh, particular application are, are quite, quite high and good. So I'll bring it all home here. This is the the, the take home. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you chose an FHB resistant variety that also has decent stripe rust resistance. Again, I don't think it's uh, stripe rust is going to be an issue. Hopefully, you didn't waste your time with FEEX 5, 6 applications of fungicide. I often get that question. I have run those trials. I have trials again this year looking at FEEX 5, 6. You heard me not even talk about early applications of fungicide. We are so far north, folks. We, we do not see benefits in terms of that early application of fungicide. If you think you're like Mississippi, and if anybody's been to Mississippi, I would argue that Wisconsin is not like Mississippi. That's where you get FEEX 5, 6, um, you know, return on investment, where, where diseases start early and, you know, you have a soupy environment to really ramp them up. Wisconsin is not that place. Save your money on those early applications. Put that money and that focus in those FEEX 10.5.1 FHB applications. You may in some years need to look at the FEEX 8. This year is not one of those. Uh, so I think we can hold off there and then, you know, spend, spend that time and effort trying to get that anthesis application of product um, on at the right time. I do mention in here Mirvis Ace and the possibility about maybe inching that earlier than, slightly earlier than 10.5.1. So 10.5, remember that's where the head is mostly uh, out of the boot. We've done some of those trials, I, and I've shown that data in the past. You could err just slightly early there, although I do not think that's a great idea. I'd rather see it actually go on just slightly later. We see better reductions in terms of Don, uh, but we do see some reduction in FHB relative to a check, even if we inch that particular product just a little early. But I would rather see us air just, just slightly late, uh, up to five days after the start of anthesis to really maximize uh, vomitoxin reductions. So with that, uh, this is my crew. My crew has been rapidly changing. We got a couple of pictures there. Uh, you'll see some, some common faces between two pictures and some new faces between the two pictures. Uh, but they're the folks that help me get all this work done on all these different crops that we uh, take care of. I'm just the pretty face that gets to uh, gets to talk about this. So I, I sure do appreciate my crew and, and all the work that they that they put in for me. So with that, I don't know, we may be bumped right up against time, but I'd be happy to uh, stick around to, to take some take some questions. Thank you, Damon. Um, before we get to questions, let's uh, do a little bit of housekeeping. If you were uh, hoping to earn CCA credits for today, you are in luck. Here's a QR code you can scan. Um, remember, we've had some questions about this in the past weeks about the QR codes not working. Just a reminder, you have to be in the CCA app for the code to work. It will not work if you are not in the app. Um, or uh, a link will be provided to fill out a form 
in the chat uh, if you would rather do it that way instead of using the QR code. So uh, there was a question um, for Damon. So Damon, with the, these new products that you were talking about, uh, are these new products in terms of chemistry, mode of action, formulation? What is the difference between these newer products and the industry standards? Yeah, good question. There, there's no new mode of action here. So we're still in the same, you know, wheelhouse of mode of action that we've had available now for, for some time. We do know the demethylation inhibitors and now the newer succinase dehydrogenation inhibitors or SDHIs, those seem to be the ones that we lean on pretty hard for uh, fusarium head blight uh, control and also uh, vomitoxin reduction. So no new mode of actions here. We're still relying on the same things. It's just uh, reformulations and, and, and um, uh, new active ingredients inside those, those modes of action. Yeah, good question. So, you know, resistance management, still an issue. Um, I cringe when folks ask me about, I'm going to willy-nilly put a fungicide on for plant health. You want to drive a public plant pathologist crazy, start talking about putting fungicides on for plant health. This is this will be the way that we will lose our fungicides because of uh, disease um, or fungicide resistance. So if you if you want a window into what's going to happen uh, with uh, a fungicide abuse, I call it. Uh, watch what's going on with the uh, herbicides on the weed weed science side of things. We're we're going to follow that suit if we just keep pumping all this fungicide out there. So uh, be aware of that. Um, uh, I am an advocate for these things to be used at the right times and on the right issues if, if there is pressure there. So, so keep that in mind. All right, any other questions? All right, so thank you very much, Damon. Um, and thanks again to Paul. That is all the time we have time for today, uh, but join us next time on June 14th at 1230, where we will hear from Dr. Emily Bick, the UW-Madison Extension funded professor of precision pest ecology, uh, and Dr. Rodrigo Worley. Uh, Emily will be speaking to us about new developments in corn rootworm across the Midwest. And Dr. Rodrigo Worley will be speaking to us about post-emergence weed control considerations. So thank you very much for joining us today, and I hope to see you next time.